My name is Brandon. I'm your host. This is a podcast hosted by Coalfield Development. And I really can't think of anybody better to talk to uh, on a podcast about Coalfield Development than Mr. Larry Castle. Larry is a very good friend, and Larry is the founding board chair of the board of directors at Coalfield Development. And uh, we started out in the summer of 2010 with uh, $25 in the bank and uh, trying to get other people to talk them into coming to be on the board. And Larry, you've believed in me and you've believed in the vision of this organization and, uh, and your leadership has really gotten us where we are. And I just can't thank you enough. Well, thank you, Brandon. Uh, it's been a pleasure for me sitting watching the growth of Coalfield and all the uh, things that it's accomplished over the years. It's just been a tremendous experience. And I was retired when I came on board with Coalfield. You know, you used to, it was me and you. And I think you said, uh, uh, I'd like to be executive director. And I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's all. <laughs> that's how it started out. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's amazing what you've done with Coalfield. I always liked you. We had, you know, as a, as a uh, intern, summer intern, and you, you did really well. And we were, uh, I was the intern for the housing authority. Housing authority. Yes. And that's where Coalfield came from was out of the housing mm -hmm. authority. And, uh, then when you came back, you graduated and we hired you to work full time for the housing authority. And we wanted you to be the executive director of the housing authority, but you had other things in mind that we didn't really understand at the time. <laughs> I know uh, when you came out and said, you know, you wanted to start a nonprofit, it was kind of like, oh, okay, you know, and, and it wasn't, wasn't really accepted real quick. And I remember Tim, Tim Kinsey, he's a good friend and a good friend of yours. He said, the kid's just got a job that pays. And now he's wanting to do something that don't pay anything. <laughs> 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 sort of counterintuitive yeah. yeah but i liked you i jumped in i jumped at the opportunity to be on the board and i was the first member and i'm i'm glad i was I, you know and everything went really slow for a while mm -hmm. and, slow start yeah you went for what two years without any pay and you got a little bit of a part-time job with the eda to pay i guess pay the gas bills <laughs> <laughs> but it's been it's been a wonderful experience you already had this figured out. I didn't know that at the time you had already been contemplating how to do this and you had a plan in mind. And I remember we started out with low income housing. That was the thing, you know, it was a selling thing to start with. And then it wasn't too long ago. You came up with uh, having employees and training them. And you said, what do you think about this? I don't know. I don't know whether they're working on it, but we, we can try it and see how it goes. <laughs> and from there it just went, skyrocketed but you, you know. were willing to try which counts for a absolutely. lot absolutely you know we talk about agreeing and disagreeing mm -hmm. at times we've not always agreed but when we talk about it we agree yeah you know if we, and we always in, in the a deep respect for one another oh sure right? i had confidence and faith in you i mean i i really really did i i thought you knew what you was talking about i thought you did a really good job and it was your passion and your ideas that that made Cofield today, that's what what it is today. And it, my goodness, how how would you describe going from zero to where we're at now? And I'm not really up on what where where we're at now, but it's a tremendous uh, expansion. Yeah, it. I mean, I would say it, at this point, it's sort of already exceeded, you know, the original goals <laughs> uh, that never, we would have had. But folks would be surprised. I mean, the early days there. We would, we would have call a board meeting. Only you and I would show up sometimes, you know? Yes. And we'd do the financial report and it'd be really straightforward because <laughs> it was such a small amount of money. Right. And um, I mean, it, it could not have started any more grassroots than it did to be totally right. honest. Yeah. We'd have board member that would come to one meeting and not come back and, you know, and people, yeah, I'll be on the board and then not show up. And <laughs> I think both of us, we stuck with it though, because we knew the need Yes. for true economic development Right. was, was so intense. And so we had a passion for that and, and, and we stuck with it. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the, your passion comes from your, your born and raised in the Southern part of Wayne County. You right. understand you understand these issues. Can you tell folks about what it was like growing up in, in, in Wayne County? 
I'm a throwback. I, uh, I was raised in a home uh, about 20 acres, a small subsistence farm. My parents did uh, menial jobs, restaurants, uh, labor, uh, state road, you know, those type of things. Used to be when the Republicans were in, my dad worked on the state road. When the Democrats were in, he didn't. <laughs> it used to be that way, you know. Yeah. But uh, we just, you know, lived out of the garden a lot. We had a milk cow and chickens and pig, you know, kill every year in the uh, we didn't have any running water. We had an outdoor toilet, and that's the way I was raised. But, uh, you know, my mom and dad wanted me to be raised in Fort Gay, and I wanted to be raised in Fort Gay and, and in the country setting. I loved it out in the country. I live very close to where I was raised. I bought the, all the land. Still surrounding, today. Yes, today. I built a new house and, and, and bought the land that surrounds my mom and dad's place. So I have a couple hundred acres <laughs> and we love it. I have a high tunnel greenhouse, you know, and I still have a garden. We can, you know, kind of can 70 quarts of beans last, last year. And, you know, we can tomatoes and beans and have potatoes and corn and, you know, stuff out of the garden, peppers and that type of thing. And we, we still put it up, you know, we can make jelly and blackberry jelly and all kinds of stuff like that. You know, it's good stuff. I've had some of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we enjoy lifestyle yeah and and even as a kid i mean is it fair to say maybe not a lot of financial income but you had skills you had yeah. some land and it sounds like you all were able to take care of yourselves mm -hmm. well i remember at times when times were a little harder you know um my dad would drag in wood and when i got home from school i got on one end of a crosscut saw and he got on the other and we sawed enough wood up you know to last us mm -hmm. as long as we could we sawed the so I, for firewood for firewood yes we heated with wood and coal and had a, a, a we had a wood stove when i was young and then we got a gas stove a bottle gas stove eventually but the uh, city water was never available still not available you know we live two and a half miles from town and we can't get city water and <laughs> still on a well yeah still run a well yeah. yeah but it was uh you know i knew that i didn't have all the advantages that everyone else had um but that's okay i don't i I love my childhood. I was an only child. So I didn't, there wasn't any neighbor kids very close, you know, about a mile down the road or something. And I would go occasionally, but basically I was by myself a lot or with my parents, you know, and uh, one thing my mom did, she read to me a lot mm -hmm. I, when I was probably old enough to read to myself, but she was still, she loved to read and she, she would read to me. And I got a lot from that. I didn't do very good in English. But I'm good at English now because I've re I've continued to read my whole life. It makes up for it, doesn't it? Yeah, and it, it, I don't might not be able to tell you what it is, but it just doesn't sound right. Yep. You know? Yep. And uh, did you all did you hunt for food? Oh yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. We hunted some, not a great deal. We weren't big hunters, but you know, at the time I was raised, there was no turkey and no deer in Wayne County or in this part of West Virginia. Really, that's hard to imagine now. So it the is. DNR is. <laughs> purposely yeah. brought that back to, that's right yeah. they sure have i i was at camp caesar up in west virginia one year and they they showed bringing the first deer into wayne county wow they unloaded them from a, tra a train and uh, <laughs> that's they, amazing they traded turkey for them wild turkey that they had caught up in the mountains and, and they traded them for the deer and that that was a good experience i when i got in school in high school you know i could care less where i went to school or not when i was younger but then i got involved in ffa and I was a, the president for my junior and senior year, and I traveled around a lot, uh, competed a lot in, the, in all the different functions, you know, parliamentary procedures, and I was in speech contests, and we did, you know, land judging and all this kind of stuff. We traveled, and, and uh, we got to go to camps in the summertime, like Jackson's Mill, you know, and Camp Caesar, and I don't remember all the names of them, but that was a very good experience. And you learned a lot because they had people there that taught classes and went to those classes. And I was very emphatic. I made a speech. Um, the guy that beat me went on to the region. I come in second place. Speak <laughs> like a speech competition. Yes. Mm -hmm. I made a, a speech. It was about an eight minute speech is on conservation and man. Yeah. Let us begin with a workable definition of conservation. <laughs> that's how your speech started <laughs> yes I, I was very big into conservation you know you hear the the green uh the green everything green well with my land and my family our footprints probably almost nothing <laughs> yeah. as a matter of fact they all the time try to sell me stuff to make uh carbon dioxide for my greenhouse so my plants will grow better <laughs> <laughs> it is interesting man i think 
you know, in Appalachia, the, the word green, you know, it gets political, but I think the traditional Appalachian lifestyle of, you know, a small subsistence farm is about as sustainable an environmental livelihood you could lead. Yes. Mm-hmm. Everything, you know, everything's used. Everything, you know, you, you can your can your green beans and then you use them and you can then use a jar the next year to can them again. Yep. And, you know, only thing you keep the ring, but you don't keep the seal. That little old round seal is the only thing gets thrown away. So you went to Fort Gay High School? Yes. What did a lot of your classmates have you stayed in touch with your classmates and some you know. uh-huh. i guess i'm a little bit different because you have a class reunion and everybody talks about how they loved school and how you know they think back to high school and i you know i do and i appreciate everything i ha- got in high school but the biggest thing i ever did is when i left <laughs> <laughs> sure you ever heard the song uh, reading and writing in route 23 by dwight yoakam Ah, I'm going to have to look it up. Reading, writing, Route 23. <laughs> the jobs that lay waiting in the big city factories. He was raised in the uh, jobs. Floyd County, Kentucky, and his family moved to Columbus and went back and forth every Friday night. And they'd come back home on the weekends. And he wrote that song about a large number of people that did that when I was growing up. There's no jobs in this area. There's no McDonald's, you know. And uh, most people around here never heard of it. And yet that connection, there's very little economic opportunity. And yet our people still feel so connected to that landscape, to that place, to that culture. They Uh, still come back. We have a a homesickness. We have a family reunion, you know, in Labor Day weekend. And we always get people coming back, coming home. Yeah. From far and wide. (laughs) Yeah. And some of them didn't really live here that long. And some of them not at all, but they still come home. They still feel a connection. Yeah. They it. say that the, the one thing that all West Virginians know is where they're going to be buried. Yeah, I've heard that too. Yeah, it's true. You know, but when I left, when I left, I went to, uh, I worked the summer. I was too young. I was 17. I couldn't get a real job. So I worked for the department of agriculture in Wayne, uh, grading and, and uh, tomatoes at a tomato program that lasted through the summer. And then after, when I turned 18 in August, I went to Ohio, I worked at McDonald's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then I worked at Westinghouse electric made him wash the machines and I worked around the assembly line and that Big was a job in the factory. I would, I had a jacket, you know, it said Fort gay on it and everybody would say, Hey, how's everything down home? <laughs> They'd want to know the updates. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Everybody, every, I was, you know, everybody talked to me and I know I knew several people that worked there that, that I hadn't known before, you know, didn't know they worked there, but I ran into them up there. And then they had a big layoff. They had a, they signed their contracts. So what year a, that would this have been? That would have been in 66. In Christmas of 66, I came home. I'd just gotten laid off. And then I went to. Um, what What did that, was that your first ever time ever getting laid off? Yeah. What did that feel like for you? Do you remember? I had already planned. I had plans to go to electronic school. So you weren't worried about it? No. <laughs> no, I, I wasn't, no, it didn't bother me at all. I'll tell you one thing, though, that happened. When I was looking for a job the first time, I went to Columbus and I went to this company. I don't even remember what the name of it was. And, and I was just a kid. And I was just looking for a job, man. He gave me a hard time. Said, yeah, you hillbillies come up here and we hire you and you get a couple of paychecks and you go back home. That was the farthest thing from my mind. I was just want to, you know, be successful, get some money. You know, wow. <laughs> I wanted a job, something I could stay with. But uh, during the time that that happened, I worked at Westinghouse and I went to school and I went in the military and, I, and then when somebody interviewed me, if they took the wrong step, I was all over. <laughs> I had had several years to prepare for those questions that I couldn't answer very good to start with because I'd never heard of them before. What's the next step? So you came back home that Christmas of 66. I went to electronic school in Ashland, Kentucky. Mm-hmm. And it was uh, probably the forerunner of ACC. It was like ACTC or something like that. And it was a two year program. We went 11 months a year and we, focused on electronics. We did math, of course, Cook's math, and then electronics and, and did the experiments and the theory and all that stuff. And it's pretty well trained. And your when I got your parents were supportive of, yes. of, of higher ed. Mm-hmm. Sounds like they really instilled a, the value of learning. Well, after I, after I left home, my parents moved to Huntington and got a, a job with uh, vocational rehab mm-hmm. okay. and worked with uh, people that had been in uh, mental facilities and they were uh, transitioning from from there to the outside to 
living on their own. And I often wonder, they talk about all these homeless people and everything. And, you know, I knew people that mom and dad worked with that they couldn't function. You know, they would go times they couldn't function. They wouldn't take their medication and then just, you know. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's what all that's going on out there now with those homeless people and all those places and stuff. It's mental health crisis. Right. I think it's a mental health crisis, yes. So what happened after electronics school? After electronics school, I was 1A, getting ready to go to Vietnam. <laughs> Your draft. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I went and took my physical for the draft, and I passed it. And they said, okay, we'll be calling you here in a month or two. Well, at the time, I was working at Beco, a little company in uh, Warner Robins, Georgia. That's, I couldn't get a job around here. I went to Georgia and got a job. I worked on ANFRC 27. Aircraft. How'd you pick Georgia? Just I had that's... relatives down there. Okay. Right. I worked on AF, ANFRC 27 aircraft transceivers, rebuilding them for the military. And that's what their job was. And so I got my uh, draft notice and I went and talked to the recruiter in Macon, Georgia. And he said, oh yeah, you know, I had to take the test and I made pretty high on the test. And then, so I went and, um, joined and so he sent a letter to the draft board saying i would be in the air force before the draft date hmm. and then when he got it back he just changed it and i didn't have to go for another couple two or three weeks i found out how the government works <laughs> but there's no repercussions i was going anyway and i ended up uh, there at Beco. there's a guy came there to work and he had just gotten out of the air force and he said you going in the air force and i said yes he said uh, Here's what you do. You put in for 304XO, radio relay, you know, equipment repair. And you're in communications. You have tropo, you know, you have a CRC and stuff like that. And uh, put in for Southern Spain. I just come back. You'll love it. And that's exactly what I did. I got in radio relay and then I got in, I got Spain. And me and my wife lived there for three years and it was a site. It was downtown. You, of course, you got the extra rations for extra food and stuff like that. And, and, lodging and we lived in apartments that were nicer than anything we'd ever lived in before wow. <laughs> and they were you know a lot cheaper than they would be here <laughs> while we were there we we traveled a lot did anyone in spain call you a hillbilly uh i don't think they called me a hillbilly i don't think they knew that term so it's, it's interesting <laughs> probably in some ways you got treated better uh -huh. there than you did here in some cases yeah i mean yeah especially with the girls, you know, <laughs> of course, when I wasn't, I was married, I wasn't <laughs> doing that, but most of the young guys that went over there for three years that weren't married, got married while they were there. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I mean, the women were beautiful and then they were very uh, accommodating to Americans, you know? And so that, I guess most of them worked out. I've, I've, I, I have contact with several, one of my best friends I ever had was a, a Chicano from divine Texas. Mm. And, uh, he was married to a Greek girl and we, you know, we were best friends over there and, and our wives got along good. And we spent uh, 10 days with her family in Athens, Greece. Wow. And it was her widowed mother, her older brother, his wife, their two daughters and her younger brother that was still living at home. And uh, we couldn't communi communicate with any of them. <laughs> the two little girls were dressed with a thing to ward off the evil eye. Hmm. And the, the grandmother said that, the evil eye, there's a guy in her village before she moved to Athens that had the evil eye so strong that he cracked a rock. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, it is. Interesting. But we, we saw, you know, went to the Acropolis and saw now the where, So growing up in Fort Gay, where is the furthest you'd traveled before you headed to Spain? Mostly Ohio. Mm -hmm. You know, around Mansfield, Columbus, Ohio, in that area. Yeah. That's where most of my relatives went to when they For lived. For jobs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My aunt went to... Uh, I got a job at the base in Shelby, Ohio, and then they transferred her to Georgia. That's how I got so the Georgia. Got to Georgia. Mm -hmm. You weren't scared to go overseas? No. Yeah, just you're an easygoing guy. <laughs> I like just you're about everybody. Guy. Yeah, yeah, people person. I, you know, there's not very many people that I don't like. Yeah, and, that's you know, true. I can attest. <laughs> I give them a hard time sometimes, but <laughs> it's all in fun. I guess the kind of people I don't like are people that think they know it all and you don't know anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that happens. Talks down. Yeah. I probably had an advantage at times because you're from, you're from West Virginia. You know, you're, you're probably not very smart, but, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they underestimated you. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. And you get that. That gives you a little bit of an advantage there. You know? Of course I'd went to electronics school, but when I went through electronics training at Keesler air force base, I didn't have time. My mom got a letter. So I was in the top 10%. She liked that. I'm sure she was proud. <laughs> Your mom brief sidetrack was, uh, 
uh, a Rosie the Riveter. Yes. Is that right? Yes, they lived in Baltimore, somewhere around Baltimore, and uh, have some pictures of them with their apartment up there, and had an aunt and uncle that uh, lived up there, and, and he worked in an aircraft factory. My mom put those, uh, she was on the back side of the rivets, is what she told me. She had a little ball-peen rivets. hammer that she used, she brought home with her. And uh, my dad worked for the electric company, putting lines in, electric lines in and stuff. And um, I had an aunt and uncle that was, he was in the army and they lived not too far from there. So they had the connection. I don't know, probably would never went up there on their own, you know, but my mom and dad both ended up getting their GEDs mm -hmm. and my mom worked uh, longer for vocational rehab, you know, and she worked with a lot of people there and, and, uh, had, and ended up retiring. And Lifelong learners. Oh, yeah. Right? Lifelong learners. I'll tell you a little story. I have an aunt and uncle. My aunt still lives up here beside of me and her close to me. She's 89 years old. But her and her husband didn't finish the eighth grade, neither one of them. Have two kids that have PhDs. What I'm teaching here at Marshall right now in geology, he retired, I think, from Kent State, and he's down here. And then uh, the other one that lives in Asheville, North Carolina, and she has um, her own business. She's an industrial psychologist. And then they have one that works at Cabell, and she has a degree. And then the other one doesn't. But, you know, she was probably the smartest one of the bunch. <laughs> it's, it's funny how it turns out sometimes. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, when they grew up, there's no need for education. You know, my grandpa made my, my aunt quit school because women didn't need that much education. And just because somebody doesn't have a certain piece of paper doesn't mean they're not highly intelligent. Not at all. People. Yeah. This is, you know, I've been in a lot of places in the world and, and it's harder to compete here because I think that most people that would have went on and got engineering degrees and stuff, they're working on, on my technical level, you know, I mean, there's technicians and stuff and yeah, they're pretty sharp. Yeah. <laughs> so what happened after the military? After the military, I got out, I came back and uh, lived in Huntington for a couple of months. I drew unemployment and I got on at the nickel plant on the board, hired me in the, in the lab on as a salary play employee. And I, Worked for the instrumentation shop up there for about four and a half years. And I had a great job. Loved it. Um, liked everybody. I had one of those jobs where you cover the whole plant, you know. You, okay. you go here, there, and everywhere, wherever they need you, and you get to know everybody. I, my first job was changing charts, and they got hundreds of charts. So I worked midnights by myself, and I would go through the whole plant changing charts and got to know everybody. And it was it was great. But then you, you remember the big gas? You may not remember that. The gas shortage. No, I don't. Well, like in the seventies. Yeah, they had um, they had gas lines up there. I could stand up and walk through, and I was thinking, boy, <laughs> I wonder what this is going to do for the plant. Well, the the plant didn't do very well after that. You know, they end up getting sold, and the guys lost a lot of their benefits and stuff like that. And but uh, so I hired on at Ashland Chemical. It's a new plant. Uh, hired on there in this instrumentation. I was a top. I was a senior guy there in instrumentation. When and did, did, did this all still tie to that electronics degree, similar yes. skill set? Mm -hmm. So I mean, you really you were blessed with your education, and then your military experience. Oh yeah, really served you well. It did. Yeah, yeah. The military. I can't say enough for the military. I didn't want to go. I was the last person to go in the military, but I was going to have to, so mm -hmm. I went. The Navy said they would take me and, and get, you know, give me an E3 status and, but they'd make sure I learned how to swim. So I didn't go to Navy. <laughs> do, you, do, do you know how to swim? No. To this day? <laughs> no. <laughs> I've been snorkeling in the Adriatic uh, yeah. and stuff like that, but uh, I want something there. I don't, I can't make it on my own. Yeah. We've had a wonderful life. The, the, the time in Europe, we stayed there. We didn't come home. We, you know, my mom said, we'll pay your way if you want to come home. I said, um, we'll be home in three years, you know, but we, you know, we went to Portugal, we went to Morocco, you know, and we, uh, we drove from Sevilla, Spain, Southern Spain and Andalusia to Athens, Greece and up through France. And we went through Madrid, you know, and Barcelona and Marseille and Cannes. How did that travel, Larry? How, you know, I mean, not a lot of people period get to have an experience like that. Yeah. early in their life certainly you know not a lot of Appalachian folks you know, have the privilege to get to travel overseas um, how do you think that changed you as a person it made me have more understanding of other people yeah mm -hmm. you know I'm go back to Fort Gay and people that's never been out of Fort Gay telling me how other people think and and I say, I don't say anything but I'm thinking no they don't yeah <laughs> that's not the way they think at all what they perceive it to be is not 
what it really is. Sometimes we just, if we've not been exposed, right. how can we know? If I've never run any, anybody ever had any problems with in Europe. I mean, everybody was nice and kind and you know what I mean? They spoke a different language, maybe even had a different yeah. religion, different mm -hmm. background, but at the end of the day, good, kind people, right? Just trying to right. have a good full life. Yeah. So military, good professional experience, good technical education, tough economy in the 70s, and that leads uh -huh. you to Ashland Chemical. Yes. And then you have a pretty good long run there, right? Run of 30 years, you know. I was there about 30 years. And the re I was on the uh, EDA, uh, Harold Hicks. Economic Development Authority. Yes. Economic Development Authority. Harold Hicks was a plant manager, and, and me and Harold had a very good relationship. And so he was on the economic development and he said, uh, would you go on the economic development for me in Wayne County? And I said, sure. And that's what got me started on economic development. Then they put me on the housing authority. Judy DeBoer was, uh, I think the one that nominated me. And, uh, uh, you know, Judy was a big supporter of yours and her husband, Gerald, uh, Gerald was on the Cofield board. But Gerald was the second best board member. We found Gerald. <laughs> He actually came to the meetings and he, yes. he really forced us to, he was a detailed guy yes. sort of got on my nerves at the time. He wanted every D if you, if I had something wrong in the minutes, yes, he would correct it. But in the end, I think it was good for us yeah. to have a details guy. Like uh, it's great. He had experience, you know, and uh, everything worked out really well. And then, and then Gerald was a great guy. He was from, he was born in golden Colorado, but he lived most of his life in Michigan. I believe worked for the uh, Chrysler. And Judy was from Wayne. Yep. She's from Wayne. So they moved back here after they retired and they were wanting to help people out and stuff. Commitment to service. Yeah. And Gerald passed away after not too many, not too long on the we board. Lost him. Yeah. yeah. You're about as busy in retirement as you were in the peak of your career. Right. Yeah. We've been through some difficulty the last couple of years. My wife's had breast cancer and she had another surgery before that. The last two years, she's had three surgeries and two of them are cancer. And I've had the last year, I've had two surgeries and been in the hospital four times, but we're in good shape. Right. You know, we're, it's, it's down downhill side. We're getting ready to hit it again. You, you have a beautiful marriage. I do want to give a shout out to, to Connie and you all you just support one another. Oh yeah. Steadfastly. We couldn't do the things we do, you know, if we did. And then, and we'll be married 55 years in November. She's right. the love of my life. My high school sweetheart. Only 55. girl ever dated. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm very happy. 55 years. Yeah. And we, you know, we kind of, you know, we support each other, like you say. And I coached volleyball at Tulsa High School. I was one of, you're famous in Wayne County for as a volleyball <laughs> coach, Coach Castle. 15 years. And then the, we, we started out the first year, we didn't win a game. I coached with Jamie LaHoda also, me and Jamie and my wife, Connie. And uh, we coached 15 years. And in 09, we went to state tournament one of the most awesome things for the girls and for me that I'd ever seen. Yeah. We go in and, and they call the girls names as they run out on the, on the floor. And I'm already after me and Connie are after she's at the scores table and I'm standing there beside her and, and watching the girls. And there's, I don't know, eight or 10,000 people there, you know, and they're jumping up and hollering and screaming. And there was three games that went on at the same time. And uh, one of them was spring Valley. So there's all kinds of people there that knew us. We played spring Valley also. They were triple A, we were double A, and then Buffalo Putnam played single A on in the other end of the court. But our girls were just awestruck. A hundred people was a lot to come to our games. You know, I've been with you at events in the community, and I know girls here on your team will still come up to you. Oh, yeah. You know, give you a big hug and ask how you're doing and talk about what a good experience they had. Yeah. And I went after I retired, I laid out a year and then they needed somebody at Fort Gay. So I coached down there for three years. And I coached some of the daughters of the girls that had played for me. <laughs> now that's an experience. That was yeah. great. <laughs> Their daughters would complain, you know, and they say, ah, he was a lot harder on me than he is you. <laughs> and they'd just laugh at him. Yeah. But they, uh, yeah, they, it was a very good experience. Uh, I think I have good relations with just about all of them. So you, I mean, Larry, you served on multiple boards, mm -hmm. coached, volunteered. I know you're also very active with your church, helping uh -huh. your church build a whole new church chapel, if I'm <laughs> yeah. not mistaken, served your country in the military. Uh, what is it? You know, you, you've got a deep commitment to, to service. What, you know, what is it that 
that created that inside you? I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But the thing of it is, I enjoy, I think that the people here, I understand them pretty well. I, I, I'll tell you one thing. It's like uh, Cofield was interviewing a boy up at uh, Calsa High School. And, uh, For when, our 33, 6, and 3 program. Yes. You weren't there. It was me and maybe Ryan and some, some other people. And they said, they were looking at his records. And he said, well, he missed 12 days of school last year. I said, he lives on Hampton Ridge. Hampton Ridge, you know, you probably couldn't get out of there for 12 days out of, the, out of the winter. It was a bad winter last year. I mean, you know, there's things like that that you know. Yeah, local knowledge. Yes. You can look at that and say, wow, he didn't go to school. He missed a lot of school. Not when you realize where he lived and how yeah. bad the roads are and how the less kept up they are and yeah. the buses don't run. That apparently. does remind me, you, you helped with our interviews. The first crew we ever hired came out of Tulsa High School. Right. Hugh Roberts, the vocational teacher, helped us identify our first on the job training crew. Uh -huh. And then you've done interviews ever since. And, and one of our, our favorite, uh, I, I wonder if you could tell the story of one of our favorite Remember, His name was Jacob. Yeah. Uh, one of our favorite trainees and what's your local knowledge of him and his background and what Coalfield developments meant for him. Yeah. I think he was the only one in his family that ever finished high school, not, not college, not college, high, high school. school. Yeah. And he was, uh, you know, uh, didn't have, I didn't think he had much of a, and his teacher said, you know, said, hire, you know, if you can hire this guy. And he told me he knew that, you know, and we did. And he turned out to be great. And that's just like with Coalfield. You can't measure right now what an effect Coalfield has had in this area mm. because it affects the person that's, that gets the training, that goes on to get their schooling and their kids. And their kids' kids, and, and it's going to it'll go right on. And at the end, the end result is how many people have has that affected? Yeah. And Coalfield does that every year. And you know, we we talked about uh, if somebody works for Coalfield for a, a year, and they get a job making twenty dollars an hour at a cabinet maker shop or something like that, that's a completion. That's success. Gosh, it's and that's just, Jay. He's a union carpenter now, mm -hmm. you know, but his. When he first started, I mean, he'd hardly say a word. I mean, in his interview, you know, he'd give sort of yes, no answers. Yeah. <laughs> and that was about it. He just yeah. blossomed. Yeah. So. But just think uh, how many kids, and there's been several of them. I mean, not, not several, been a bunch of them now. You know, I I'm, I'm think more of the beginning type years. Sure. But we, we have, uh, Coalfield has touched so many, you know, that's made a life for them because, I know there's people that want, wouldn't go to Marshall because they're scared. Yeah. You know, if anything, they would go to Southern and Williamson and rather than going to Marshall, we want, we tried to start a junior college at Fort Gay hmm. one time back years ago. The EDA was Charlie Sammons was one of them that was uh, pushing it. And, and uh, they threw a fit, you know, so, well, it's Marshall territory, you know, and, uh, but it's a natural draw. Cause it's the bridge is there. You got the good highways on the other side and you know, it would have been a natural draw for people from Kentucky south of Fort Gay and north of Fort Gay. They would all come there, right. You know, for the yeah. first, first two years or whatever. And it didn't, it didn't go, but I think it should have. And I think it was a good idea. You know, you, you've been very involved in local politics. Oh yeah. And of course this podcast, we're not allowed to endorse <laughs> no. candidates. So we won't talk any uh -uh. specific names, but I wonder just, West Virginia politics, it's sort of a unique brand of, of politics. And, and yeah. what have you learned uh, by being involved with some various campaigns? Let me tell you a little story. <laughs> uh, the plant manager at Ashland Chemical, he was not from here. He was raised in St. Louis, but he had, he had, he had worked for Ashland for years. He'd been uh, outside the country, and he's one of Ashland's top people. I think they ranked him sixth. Paul Shelgren, I think, or something that said he was six or somebody like that. And, uh, but he was, uh, kind of hard to get along with. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to end up being a good guy as plant manager. And he didn't know how he didn't know how to talk to people back in the old days, engineers, they worked with things. They don't want nothing to do with nobody else. Yeah. They, they had ideas. They want to put their little things together and don't leave me alone, you know, and that's <laughs> changed some, you know, in, in, the younger engineers have more personal skills, but if you want to really make money, you want to be a plant manager or something like that. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, got to figure out people you got it. Yeah. You got to do that. And so he told me one time, he knew I was involved in politics and he said, uh, 
my daughter-in-law is working on her. She's a principal at a school and she's working on her PhD in education. And her dad tells her who to vote for. I said, that's the way it is. <laughs> mm. Families generally stick together in this area. Mm. You know, uh, like, certain people, they would say carry votes. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And that means if, if you went over one person in a holler, you went over a, a slew of folks that look to them. Whether it's grandpa or dad or, mm. you, you know, they're going to tell you how to vote. And, you know, they're going to know the people now. When I started getting involved in politics, um, I didn't realize this. And I didn't really have a, a, I had a slate, you know, that I supported, but I didn't really have a, like, you know, anyone that I, any particular person that I really yeah. supported hard. And right. people would come to me and said, who do you want me to vote for? And I said, well, what do you mean? And so, well, you know, them guys, I don't know them. You know, you know, whether they're good guys or not, just tell me who to vote for. And that happens. It's amazing how often that happens. Yeah. They know I'm at the meet the candidates and I'm talking to all the candidates and stuff like that. And yeah, I have uh, some favorite ones. And the one that's not in politics anymore was Truman Chafin. I represented Truman Chafin in Wayne County for several years. And that was an awesome experience. I know you were a go-to, go-to man for <laughs> Truman for a long time. Right. And I still, still have a good relationship with Truman. We communicate not, not as often, but a few times a year, you know, and, his wife uh, ran for Supreme Court. She didn't win, but it's probably a good thing because right after that is when all those justices got in trouble. Yep, the mass <laughs> resignation for yeah. waste, fraud, and abuse. That was the ones that uh, if she'd won, she might have got mixed up in that stuff. But she's a great, great lady. Truman and Tish are both great people. Well, Larry, my, my last question to you is we're, we're coming up on time. You know, what are some of the biggest changes you've seen in, in Southern West Virginia? And then what are some of the changes that you still hope to see some things you think need to change in the future. People do get out more. The guidance counselors do more. Mm -hmm. um, when I went to school, guidance counselor didn't do anything. They just had a name, you know, and maybe go over your test scores with you or something. But they, they don't, uh, the ACT, there was never a prep program. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a scholarship at WPU and one of our early. Uh, your family sponsors a scholarship. Yes. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's for anybody, but it's basically uh, financed by my, my relatives. Right. And we had a girl that made 18, which was a bare minimum to get in WVU. And she got in. Well, we gave her a scholarship. She got, she was made a dean's list, she made straight A's. And she went to pharmacy school in three years. And now she's here working as a pharmacist yep. in Wayne County. Now, that's pretty good. <laughs> but the people weren't preparing for the test to get in the colleges. You know, right. one of the girls that played volleyball for me, she was a all state, you know, all state player in volleyball. She was the player of the year in basketball. And she ended up being the starting point guard at Navy for three years. Now she's a pilot wow. stationed at Pensacola. And that's Kara Pollinger, you know, she was a tremendous athlete. Her sisters were too. It's incredible. Yeah. Those type of things. So in some ways see. there's more opportunities now. There, there's a lot more opportunities and people are not as negative. Education used to be, ah, you know, you don't need that. Get a job, go to work, you know, go out there and dig the taters. <laughs> and I love agriculture. You know, I love uh, conservation. I proposed back in the sixties when they were at just, I don't know where East Lynn had been started or not, but they were talking about East Lynn. And I said, you know, you need to put electrical generator. East Lynn Lake. East Lynn Lake. Yes. And on there, and they said, oh, no. I talked to, uh, uh, you know, politicians. I was FFA president, and I traveled around the state, and I talked to some influential people, and they said, no, it'll never pay for itself. My goodness. How many times? Would if it, only they would have listened. Yeah. <laughs> we have the peaking plants, you know, and I, I knew one of the plant managers down by the water plant, Canova, and it went through the plant, and they might only operate a few hours a year. And they they got a computer that tells them the price of electricity and when it hits a certain level, they turn it on. They cut that plan on. They can be uh, eight hours away and cut that plan on and start it running. It'll run eight hours by itself without anybody there. It's pretty amazing. It is, yeah. The main thing we need here is the highway, 72, 73 interstate. Now I was told recently by a high level politician that that's never going to happen. Because they said make two million dollars a day on the turnpike and they ain't never going to build that highway. We're just we're trying to get it to uh, Pritchard, you know, been trying for years. And when they came out with the tax thing, it was supposed to be, oh, we'll build a four lane to Pritchard. 
maybe four guys. And then, uh, <laughs> and then they said, oh, no, there's an Indian relic there. We can't do that. But it didn't, it wasn't for the whole section. It was just that one part there by Knox Creek, I think. And they never touched it. But we still pay our taxes every year, the increased taxes that we voted in, you know, to make that road possible. And uh, they have a, a couple of miles of four lane at Crumb. Half of it's blocked off. It's been there for years. Yeah. Road to nowhere. Road to nowhere, yeah. And if they would just tie that in right. on the, say, the Jenny's Creek side, you could use that and it would be a big help. It would cut several minutes off the, tra off the traffic, you know. All in all, though, given experience with Coalfield, your experience in the community, your experience in local politics, I mean, do you feel hopeful for oh, the future yeah. of West Virginia? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We've, uh, you know, they talk about coal. Coal will be back. They're going to need it someday for something. And, uh, you know, used to a few years ago, coal was everywhere. And a lot of people worked in the mines. A lot of people drove coal trucks, made good money. And now you see very few coal trucks and very few mines. But they've still got it. And as long as you've got it, you know, that's a valuable commodity. Somebody's going to want it. And, and, and a hardworking workforce, right? So even if it's not coal, mm -hmm. we can build solar farms. Oh, build yeah. Wind farms, build sure. hydro Power, we can be an energy state and be more than just coal, right? There's so many things. I mean, my goodness. I, you know, we've talked before. Um, we went to Mesa Verde in southern Colorado and saw how the Anasazis lived, the cliff dwellers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they built their, they built their uh, dwellings under the cliff. Mm -hmm. They did their farming stuff up on top and they had ladders going down. Well, in the wintertime, they were facing south and the sun shined in where their buildings were. But as the sun moved north in the summertime when it was hot, the sun hit the top of the mountain and didn't get there and it kept them cool. Mm. And they had little water things where the water ran in under the rock, you know, they, they could get a drink and stuff. And, and so my thing is. Find the sun. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that's right. My thing is uh, uh, not necessarily 100% underground, but berm houses where the south facing side of your house is open and has windows and collects the sun in the winter time. But then in the summertime, it's overhead and the dirt on top of your house from being underground, it keeps your house cool. And you can, you know, you can go out and lock the door and be gone a year and come back. And probably nothing ever happened. You're always thinking up new ideas. <laughs> I think that's a key. I think that, you know, if, if every time you build an underground house, just think about how much you shrink that footprint, you know, that carbon footprint, you know, it, it's, it, it shrinks so much and people are going to be all, build houses. I wish I had known Let's more. Do it smarter. Yeah. When I wish I knew more about this when I built my house, but uh, yeah, I, I, I would love to have an underground house. You know, I, I mean, I think that's the thing of the future, you know, electric bills are going to be so high. We, you know, they want to switch to electric, but right now you don't produce enough electric to switch to electricity. I mean, you know, it, it's not, you know, you need to go out and produce some electric, electrical generating stuff. And I don't care whether it's solar or, or however you want to do it, you know, but I think that water is a good, great thing. We have the rivers here. We, we could put water generators all over the place. We have a lot of it's lakes. One thing Appalachia has that not a lot of other places have right now is clean water. That's right. We could put electrical generators on all these lakes, you know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, we got East Lynn and Beach Fork and Wayne County and we got to, you know, Kentucky, they got a whole bunch of them over there, yep, Paintsville yep. and, well, you know, a bunch of those lakes. And it, it's hard to say how much electricity you could generate because those, those lakes, they have out water coming out all year, mm -hmm. you know, more so in certain times. But all year, there's water flowing through there. And I, I knew a guy that worked out here, and, and he adjusted those gates all the time. And two or three times a day, he would be going out and adjusting the gates of the, to adjust the To control the how water. much water, you have. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, Larry, uh, you're a good friend and uh, I just admire everything you've done for your community and something people should know as you were board chair for the first 12 years of this organization, monthly meetings. And the only reason you ever missed a board meeting would be a health, the health or family situation. Other than that, you were there hundred percent. And I'm just so grateful for everything you've done for this organization and for this community. Thank you, Brandon. Um, 
Yeah, you're supposed to go to the meetings. If you're on the <laughs> board, you're supposed to go to the meetings. Yeah. You know? <laughs> That's part of it. You know, yeah. uh, some people want them for different meeting, you know, they want to be on different boards for resumes and distinction. Make, yeah. yeah. But you know, you if you're going to be on a board, you should be there. You, you, if you don't have a quorum, you can't do no business. That's right. And you know, there's been times when you have trouble getting a quorum. And some people are not really sincere about serving and helping out, you know, but you, you weed those out over the years. And they weed themselves out. But let me say, Brandon, Cofield is you. You're Cofield. Uh, you started it. It was your ideas. And you made them happen. And gosh, just think about that. Just think about where that puts you in history. Because Cofield is one of the best nonprofits in the world. I mean, your return on investment, how, how high is it? That's way up there in it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's one of the tops yeah. ever anywhere, right? Yeah. So just think what you did. Yeah. And I mean, we did it together. I, I think about it, you know, and you're the driving force. But now there's one other thing I have to bring up is that, right. you know, I tell young guys, and they've done this a few times, that if you want to be successful, you just find a good-looking woman that's smarter than you are <laughs> and do whatever she says. I said, that's what I did, you know. And then I know Park Ferguson, you know, I've told him that and he married Lacey and they, <laughs> he said, Larry, you're getting in my head, but you did the same thing. You know, I did. I did. we didn't do anything until I actually came along. <laughs> That's true. The <laughs> X know, factor. We yeah. were, we were nothing, you know, <laughs> we were just a bunch of guys having spaghetti. Well, you were there when I met, when I met my future wife, I, I saw that spark. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, Brandon, you're going to go over and get a pizza after the meeting. And he said, I think he said, I think so. And I said, he didn't invite me, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't blame him. <laughs> uh, a lot of good times, Larry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you, Brandon. I, you take an old retired guy, you know, I, I, I was retired. I was going to watch grass grow, you know, and, and <laughs> got involved in all this other stuff and politics and Cofield. Cofield has been the most successful thing that anybody's ever been involved in Cofield has been in. You know what I mean? And it's hard decisions sometimes, you know, sure. but like I said, I don't, I was thinking about this and I don't think we ever disagreed if we were able to talk about it. Yeah. The only time that we ever out. disagreed was when we, something came up uh, all of a sudden and we didn't have time to discuss it. Right. Because we always come to an agreement, you know, and, uh, I, I love you, Brandon. I, I think you're you great. I love you too. And, uh, you know, <laughs> we could always, that's the key to everything, you know, some people get mad if somebody says something to them, but if you genuinely like them, they don't get mad. Yeah, and the respect. Yeah. If you like know. people that like each other. And, we, and we, we were committed to the mission. You know, yes. Even if we maybe would do things a little bit differently at the end yeah. of the day, we never had to worry about motivations. Right. So, so you, you're a different than I. You're young, and you understand the young people. I understand more the old people. So that was great. <laughs> good team right yeah, yeah good combo <laughs> yeah well thanks for being on the podcast now lots of other people can can hear the story of some of the early days and learn more about your inspirational story and i can't wait for it hey thank you brandon let me tell you one thing you know you talk about what you're going to do in the future our ideal job mine and ideal job would be to go around like for a, a hotel or you know something like that company and critique each one as anonymously, you know what I mean? Just get in the car, <laughs> drive, viewer, drive yeah. here all over the country, outside the country, wouldn't matter. We, we always thought that would be our ideal job. We love to travel. You know, we love being home, but we love to travel. And, uh, you know, that don't you think that'd be an ideal job? I think that'd be a great job. <laughs> May it be so. And if, uh, yeah, if we, we needed to, we could take our couple of grandkids, you know, <laughs> and just act like we were there spending the night or two, you know, they never know. No. And the next day they get, Get a report from get the a company. report out. <laughs> yeah, I thought that'd be a great job. I, I, great I job. talked to some people one time that did similar thing with the company, not a hotel, but with the, with the company, and they traveled around. Mm. I thought, man, that's ideal. Anyway, that's if the, I see anything like that, you'll be the first person I let know. But I appreciate it. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> Thank you, Brandon. <laughs>